Picture, if you will, an apple. It's red or green, it's crunchy and juicy, it's a very nice apple. And that apple has a market value. Now, picture a change in the world that results in everyone deciding that apples should be free. In that scenario, what happens to the people who plant and grow and harvest the apples? They still have a product, but they can't get paid in the way they used to. Now picture that that apple is in demand everywhere. Every time you turn on your TV and see a commercial, there's that apple. When you download an app for your phone, there's that apple. In the movies, in video games, in restaurants, there's that apple. In 2014, the music business is kind of like this. Everyone wants to use music because music sets moods. It creates emotions. It makes people want to dance. In other words, it has value. Yet the marketplace says it's free. This is the dilemma that people who make music find themselves in today. It still costs the same to record and press and promote an album, yet we can't sell this product like we used to. So those of us who produce the music, the artists and labels, have to wonder how long we can keep this up. Is there a future in music, or what? Can I have a taste of your ice cream? Can I lift the crumbs from your table? Can I interfere in your crisis? No, mind your own business. I'm Portia Sabin, host of The Future of What? On today's episode, we're talking about direct-to-fan sales with several people who know a lot about it. We'll talk to Ben Hubbard of CD Baby, Benji Rogers of Pledge Music, Tim Bierman, who runs Pearl Jam's fan club, and superfan James Reeling. But we begin our show with Portland band Summer Cannibals, who just released their second album, Show Us Your Mind. Here's something new off that album. Jessica Boudreaux and Mark Swart of Summer Cannibals join us now in the studio. Hey guys, welcome to the Future of What? Thank hey, you. Hi. Thanks for having us. So congratulations on your album release. Thanks. That's very exciting. Thank you. Um, so one of the reasons we asked you to talk to us today is that you actually released this record on your own label, New Moss Records. What on earth possessed you to start <laughs> your own record label? <laughs> we didn't want to wait for somebody else to do it. Our first release wasn't for one of our bands. It was for a band called Sun Angle from Portland. Uh-huh. I had been interested in starting a label. We had had like a really small cassette tape label with a big group of friends, I don't know, probably four years ago, five years ago. And that kind of gave me a taste. I liked the business side of things, but I kind of wanted to do it more proper, I guess, and put more into it. So when we saw Sun Angle play live, that was like my kick in the butt to like, I made a business plan. We approached them and yeah, we, we liked it. Yeah, we didn't even have a name at that point. We're just like, we want to do this. (laughs) Wow. And then they kind of helped us, I guess, get it together. And uh, when it went well enough, (laughs) we decided to just go ahead and put our own music out on it. So you decided to start a label. You have never worked at a label before, I assume. Yeah. What did you, how did you do that? What did you, you put one foot in front of the other? I mean, what do you need to do to to start a label? Well, you need money. And that's probably (laughs) the hardest part. But That was years of thinking about it and planning and kind of putting things aside for it. Contacts, which is like honestly probably harder than trying to get funds together because you can kind of squeeze things into your budget and make things work for what you have. But contacts, they don't just happen overnight, you know. And we got really lucky with the first band that we put out their music because Charlie, Charlie Salas Sumara, had a project called Panther and the Planet The who had been on labels, and he kind of had some, yeah, he had some contacts, (laughs) and he helped us out. And he honestly, like, we want to start a label. We want to put out your music. And he's like, well, do you have this, this, and this? And we're like, no. (laughs) I don't even really know how to do those things. And he was a big part of helping us kind of get everything together so that, I don't know, it's funny, it was the band teaching the label. But um, it's crazy how much you learn in one release. And then two releases, and then three, you know, like, and going into this most recent one, which is the fifth, we had everything ready so far in (laughs) advance, and we were just, like, checking things off the list, and it's not, like, it doesn't go that smooth all the time, but it's crazy how quick you pick things up, you know? You just, the system's not that hard, but most bands, I feel like, when you don't have to know how it all works, why take the time to figure it out? 
Exactly. Know? We've talked about that a lot on this show. We've talked to Hutch Harris from The Thermals and Justin Ringel from Horse Feathers. And we talked to Justin a whole bunch about how it's really beneficial for a band to understand the business side because then you are just a lot more in control of your own future. You right. know what is going on. So I want to talk more about this because, of course, I run a label, so I'm interested in, you know, I can't believe you started a label in, what, 2011, 2012, something like that? Yeah, 2012. Yeah. Right. I mean, when, you know, this is the music industry is, is officially in decline. Right. So yeah. it's kind of a strange time to, to start doing this. But you guys seem to have done it, and you seem to have done it positively. Mm-hmm. Like, you feel good about it. So do you run the label sort of as a daily yes. job? Yeah. Do you absolutely. have to have a day job at this um, point? We will do things, you know, yeah. here and there. Things. Oh, like, yeah. not anything, like, like I, I gross work. or creepy. But, <laughs> <laughs> like, Mark's works at a coffee shop, and yeah. I'll do design stuff and things like that. But it's a all-the-time thing. Right. It's like from the time you wake up until you go to bed, you know, it's a lot. But it's also, to me, the music industry is in decline. But that does not mean that we're going to stop making music and stop trying to be successful at it. We want to be touring musicians. That's like the goal. It's what we want to do. And it's what we love to do. And if I didn't go after it right now, I would look back when I'm older and be like, why didn't you try, you know? And so I guess I trust myself and Mark with the business side of things maybe more than I might trust some, you know, whatever label because I don't see into their business side of things. You know what I mean? And so to me, that's like with things in decline, I'm like, okay, well, I'll take it upon myself rather than relying on somebody else who could give up next year. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. So we're talking today about direct-to-fan sales. And you guys, I think, are probably really experiencing a lot of that because you're based here in Portland and you're having a good experience with your own band at live shows. You have a lot of fans come. The obvious direct-to-fan sales is is technically merch table sales. So do you guys have a strategy for your merch table? Like do do all the band members go out after the show to sell merch or how do you how do you do that? As soon as we're done playing, Jessica just runs to the merch table, and I just he I just tear down her stuff for her. <laughs> oh, that's so um, nice. That Im- immediate face, exactly. you know, at the it just it that. just works really well, and yeah, people yeah people want to talk to Jessica mostly, <laughs> but all of us, but you know. Do you all get out there to the merch table? Yeah, eventually? we do. We do eventually. Yeah. yeah, after the gear is taken off stage. See, I was a drummer, and nobody wants to break down my gear. No. <laughs> so I was always the last to the merch table. It was very sad. And so, what do you do at your merch table? Do you sign things? Do you do photos? Like, how does that? Yeah, that well, whatever sometimes. people ask yeah. for. I'm within reason. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. Well, yeah, I'm not like. Here's a record. Do you want me to sign that? Uh, but <laughs> if like, they ask for it. Yeah, if yeah. they ask for it. And that depends on the crowd of the show. All ages crowds, it's like we do a lot you of, take a lot of photos yeah. and sign a lot of autographs. And then old people. <laughs> old people. <laughs> Sigh. <laughs> <laughs> people our age never want autographs from a little band from Portland, you know? They'll be sorry <laughs> yeah. someday. You sound like my mom. She's like, they'll see. They'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, do you guys make any special items to sell at your merch table, or do you just sell CDs and LPs? I would do t-shirts. Sometimes we have posters. I make buttons. Yeah, we we'll, we'll try to always have free buttons on our merch table for people to grab. Cool. Because some people make specialty items. I mean, you know, underwear and all sorts yeah. of stuff. Yeah. I haven't done that. <laughs> We're wanting to make hats, like knit caps, but I don't know. It's it seems like late. such a small window that people, yeah. like, that you could actually have them on the merch booth. We'll get that going next fall. Probably. Like only in the winter. Yeah. yeah. Winter like tour. Fall and winter. Winter I'm hat tour. It. Yeah. Hat, hats are over <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> So how do you guys interact with your fans online? Do you do sales? Do you do giveaways? Like, Yeah, I mean, at this level, we do, obviously, like, all of our social media stuff. And so when people order a record, I'll always write a note and, like, throw in some stuff and say thank you. And, like, with this album, with all the pre-orders, I had, like, a stack of Post-it notes, and I would just write a Post-it note. And we'd have this stuff, and, like, one person sent us a picture of it with, like, the note and all that kind of stuff. And after that, we just started getting, like... Like all of these pictures people were sending to us, and I don't know, I love that kind of stuff. Cool. But. So you guys are still doing fulfillment yourselves when you get a record order. Yeah. You yourself pack yeah. it up, yeah. and that's really nice for fans. I mean, that's the kind of direct to fan thing that I think fans really like right. and appreciate is the personal touch. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, pretty much everything is direct to fan for us, except for if you live in Portland, you can get the record at some local record stores, but we don't have physical distribution, so everything is you have to literally place an order with Jessica and I to, and we'll package it and send it to you. And that's like the only way you can get a record. Our post office is starting Unless, to get annoyed with us. <laughs> yeah. I went in yesterday with like a stack, I like carried a stack of records in and there was a big line and she was like, can you come back later? <laughs> <laughs> so thanks you guys so much for coming Thank in. You. Yeah, Thank it's you. It's been super nice to have you. Welcome back. I'm Portia Sabin. We're talking direct-to-fan sales on this episode of The Future of What? And joining us now is James Reeling. I know James well. He is the production manager at Kill Rock Stars. So, James, is it fair to call you a super fan? Um, sure. You can call me a super fan. <laughs> I love media. He's like, you pay my check. Exactly. <laughs> you can call me you whatever call me you whatever. want. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any artists that you consider yourself to be, like, a really big fan of in particular? Yeah. I mean, I would say that there's quite a lot of artists that I'm a huge fan of. I'd say there are a few that I'm kind of like completist about where I Mm. try to like collect everything of theirs. But I've never really considered like, I mean, I love like the Smiths and Morrissey, which we have in common. (laughs) But I've never felt like I need to own like every single single that's ever come out or, or, you know, or some rare version of something. It's more like I just want to have the music available to me to listen to at any point. Right. So who are some of your artists that you would consider yourself like a completist? Well, one is Aaron Dillaway, who was one of the original members of uh, Wolf Eyes. He's done a lot of like solo work that I'm a big fan of. So I think I have at least all of the LPs that he's put out. And this other artist that I love called Russian Zarlag. It's a one guy project. His name is Carlos and he's from Providence. And he writes, like, the weirdest little, like, pop songs recorded, like, on four track, just real simple, stripped down, kind of like if there's drumming, it's just, like, super minimal. It'll be just, like, a floor tom. And the songs are really creepy and weird and sound like they're, like, describing strange, like, horror films <laughs> or something. <laughs> I, and I try to collect all of his stuff because it's so strange that I feel like in 100 years people are going to be like, who was this dude? And I love synth bass, like new age music. One of my favorite artists is named J.D. Emanuel, who is actually still around and recording. He lives in Texas. But uh, the albums that he made in the late 70s and early 80s have all been reissued on vinyl. So I've been collecting that stuff. There's a Portland band called Golden Retriever, who I love. And I, I think I have all of their albums. And Morrissey. (laughs) But I actually haven't bought his last couple albums yet, so... Morrissey's so prolific, too. It's kind of hard to keep up with Yeah, they'll always be there. (laughs) You can always go get those, yeah. Yeah. Now, this guy, this Russian czar... Russian czar lag, yeah. Russian czar lag guy. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you find out about... Because that doesn't sound like you're going to... You know, it's not front page news when he releases something new. No, it's pretty obscure. I think it was because I spent a good amount of years involved with the noise scene and had a project that I did and, and toured a bunch and then kind of became involved with setting up shows in Portland. And so I just kind of absorbed it through uh, being involved with that and also just like seeking stuff out. I think that that's like a big thing that is was a pivotal part of like my youth is like going to a record store and actually like reading the descriptions that the clerks would write on records or, you know, asking to listen to things or just taking a chance on something and being like, well, this looks cool. I, I'll pay 15 bucks for it and hopefully like it. So I think that like if you want to seek stuff out, then you'll find it. Right. 
So I don't know specifically how I found out about him. I think just through the noise scene probably. How do you find out now when he puts something new out? He has like a uh, like a blog and okay. he'll like update. Because so he, cause he also draws it. comics. So he'll be okay. like, oh, I have a new comic or I have a new tape out. So we're talking about direct-a-fan mm-hmm. in this episode. And I think one of the things, I mean, we know because we run, we work at a record label and we actually have to put things out for yeah. our fans to buy. Yeah. We definitely have seen that that people are interested when you make something kind of nice yeah. for them. And so just from a fan perspective, do you feel that way? Like if you go and say, okay, so-and-so who is a band that I like is putting something out. Then you go to the website and you see not only did they put the new record out, but it comes in a beautiful package and it has, you know, whatever, like something that goes with it that's really mm-hmm. fancy. Is that an incentive for you? It can be. I mean, sometimes like price will be a factor and that'll hold me back. But I mean, I love things that like have some thought put into them. I think that kind of a byproduct of so much media becoming so like disposable where like instead of buying a record or videotape or whatever and like having that movie so you can watch it over and over again, like just like watching it off of Netflix or renting it from Amazon or something. Things that people are super into, it feels like you want to like own something like physical and tangible to uh, hold and to collect for the future. And so because things have become so like disposable, when you see something that is so obviously not disposable, it's like has that much more appeal as something that's like kind of precious or special. And especially with like a lot of the type of music that I like, like in the kind of noise stuff, a lot of it, there's so few that were made, you know, where you might, I mean, I own, I own plenty of cassettes where there's like only like 25 or like 40 were mm-hmm. made and, and same with collecting zines where I feel like a lot of the zines that I have from the 90s, it's like at this point, I might be the only person that even owns a copy of this zine. And so it feels kind of precious and it feels like something that like someday I'll donate to a museum (laughs) or something like that. And people will be like, oh, this is really an interesting part of the 90s. I'm glad it's still around. Welcome back to The Future of What. I'm your host, Portia Sabin, and today we're talking about direct-to-fan music sales. The company CD Baby started in a New York garage as one artist's dream to create a utopian record label. Since then, CD Baby relocated to Portland, grew into one of the largest vendors of independent music, and has paid out more than $250 million to artists. So how has CD Baby found this success? Joining us now is Ben Hubbard. He handles promotions for the company. Ben, thanks for coming on The Future of What? Thanks so much for having me. So I guess the first thing from a record label perspective is that CD Baby is, is for those people who've been living under a rock, basically it's the way that artists have found to circumvent record labels. So do you want to tell us about the CD Baby model just quickly? Sure. I mean, I think maybe the first, the first thing that I would note is that it's not just artists, but also a bunch of small record labels use CD Baby for distribution for their entire catalog. So we're an aggregator to iTunes and other digital retailers, as well as an online platform for artists and labels to sell their music directly to their fans, both physical CDs and digital downloads. And then we also have other sort of monetization and promotion tools that we've built as time has gone on. And obviously, CD Baby started as just the direct-to-fan fulfillment sort of thing. Derek in Derek Sivers is the founder. In his uh, garage in Woodstock, he was, you know, selling his band's CDs online and had to get a merchant account to do it. And so started, you know, doing that same thing for all of his friends. And it grew from there, moved to Portland. And 
when iTunes launched in 2003, CD Baby was one of the companies that they approached to be uh, an aggregator for independent artists so that iTunes didn't have to have separate deals with each of these indie artists. They could work with a company like CD Baby to get their music onto the service. And then as other services have launched and CD Baby started offering their own download store, things have just kind of grown from there. And it's clear that there's a demand for the services that CD Baby offers. And I think the story there is not necessarily that a company has been particularly successful, but rather that the explosion of independent music has made it just necessary for there to be companies like that that can help these artists get their music out there to the world. So maybe we could say that you guys started as a company for artists to get their music to their fans yeah. directly, and you've grown over time into basically a distributor. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, the the idea behind CD Baby is that it's a distributor that just doesn't turn anyone away. Right. You You know, we offer... As much as you can eat, you know, if you if you have people that need your music, we will definitely find a way to get it to them. Right, you know? a non curatorial distributor. Yes. Uh, yes. Th- that said, my one of my main functions at CD Baby is as our primary curator of pr- content that we promote to retail partners. So oh, that's we are funny. curatorial to some degree. Just not we work with everybody and, and right. you know use our 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 curatorial. Uh, drive, it, I think, is channeled towards the things that we that we push extra hard or, or that we push out to to retail partners for promotion. So, it, so for an artist who puts their stuff on CD Baby, if they just put it up and then never do anything, they're probably not going to move a lot of un- units. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> we've got plenty of that. And, I mean, and 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 for a lot of the folks that we work with, that's exactly what they want. You know, I mean, like, not everybody has 60 hours a week to devote them to their musical career. And Absolutely. that's what it takes. You know, yeah. like, for I mean, that's the, maybe the one silver bullet. The one thing that you could say that you're going to have to do is to devote all of your time to it. Right. And and for a lot of folks, they've got kids and they've got day job and they've got other hobbies. You know, like, people who do music as a hobby are a huge part of the CD Baby family. And it's really cool to be able to work with those people as well and, and to get those people excited about making music and talking to other people who are, you know, hobbyists. But, but you know, that said, my main clients that I work with are the folks who are sort of past that, that level and who are doing it as a career rather than as a hobby. Right. I'm glad you said that because that's what I've always had, those two words in my, in my head as well. There's, there are hobby bands and there are career right. bands. And the career bands are the ones who take it seriously and who don't. The hobbyists are the ones who, you know, I put out a record for them and then they just go and chill. And they're like, call me when you make me famous. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it, I mean, it, there's a certain aspect of that that's really charming. And I, and I think there's, I mean, there are a lot of folks who are hobbyists in the sense that they don't think about music as a, as a commercial thing. You know, I, I think of, you know, folks like Phil Alvarum who, are, who just don't, it's like the, the brain doesn't, it doesn't go in that direction, and yet he can't help but make music. Like, right. He can do nothing else but make incredible music. And right. there are tons of people out there who are like that that are just the kind of the, the eccentrics. And that's why – that's especially where I think the independent music ecosystem right now is really strong is that there are a lot of managers and publicists and tremendous indie record labels that are putting out records that wouldn't have gotten made years ago other than by – you know, they're, they're – there's a lot more bandwidth, I think, for, for really incredible music to get made right now. Right. That's a really good point. I'm glad you're so positive about it. <laughs> <laughs> so as we were getting ready for the show, we were reading a study that shows that most of the spending on music comes from super fans mm-hmm. these days. So it said about 75% of all sales come from about 40% of music buyers. So do you feel that what you see at CD Baby is similar, that super fans are creating a lot of the demand? Or is it hard to tell that it's, from your metrics? It's hard to tell. I mean, we definitely see from our, you know, from our direct marketing, from our emails that we send out, we definitely have a very definite and strong community of folks that are the primary buyers of music on our site and that – and that a lot of those are for a particular set of artists, you know, like for our for our very top selling artists, they have their community of fans and those fans buy everything that they do no matter what. Mm-hmm. But I don't I don't think I have any particular data about 
splitting that demographic right. any finer than that. In it term. might be hard for you guys to. Yeah, to well, we just don't we because our sample size at the retail level isn't particularly huge. I mean, a lot of our sales these days physically are going through Amazon or through our partnership with Alliance. So they're wholesale rather than direct retail, which is, in, I mean, to me, it's kind of crazy that this direct to fan store is we've grown our physical CD sales year over year since 2011 every year. But the growth is not in direct to fan. The growth is in distribution, actually, hmm. which is, to me, kind of contrary to the narrative that I think is prevailing that like, oh, yeah, direct to fan is the future. Right. But I think maybe not direct to fan, but that there are artists who really do have a genuine need for distribution services that are currently not able to get that from from anywhere else. So. Absolutely. And I think that's the important service that you guys are providing. And it also makes sense, in, given the climate, that that's where you guys would see growth yeah. I mean, to me. So sort of on those lines, my last question is streaming baby doesn't sound as catchy <laughs> as CD baby. <laughs> but do you feel that that is the future of the business? Yeah, I have. I mean, I don't think that any of the streaming services that currently exist are necessarily the answer. I love I mean, I, I subscribe to RDO. I really enjoy it because it prioritizes discovery and makes it really easy to find cool new stuff just by flipping through the new releases every week. But Spotify has done great work to, you know, basically <laughs> copy that wholesale. And it's really cool to be able to, to browse through all the new releases that come out in any particular week and listen to anything that I want to. That said, I still, you know, buy a ton of vinyl and that, you know, I want to own the records that I want to own. I think there needs to be something that acknowledges the social nature of music, not just in the listening act, but in the actual ownership. Like, People buy records because they want to own a piece of the artist. And I don't think that a collection on a streaming service has the same social relevance for a lot of people. And so figuring out some way to give fans the ability to interact with the artists that they want to follow on a more, like, I, I, I'm not Tangible. sure. Tangible? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. a physical object is definitely a huge part of it. Like, I love cassette tapes, and I very rarely listen to them. Like, I have a, a tape player in my car. And I listen to them sometimes in my car, but I don't. I don't listen to a lot of cassette tapes. But I love having the physical object. Right. Yeah. Well, you can tell we're old school. We both love cassettes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, what I was trying to say is, I I think that the streaming service that will exist isn't necessarily any of the models that currently exist. Gotcha. It's something. If I was the guy who could figure it out, I'd probably <laughs> yeah, you, not be talking be, to you about it. Exactly. <laughs> you'd be keeping that to yourself. Yeah. Ben, thanks so much for joining of us on the future of what. Great. Thanks so much, Marcia. Ben Hubbard runs promotion for CD Baby here in Portland. He joined us in the studio. Beerman is the manager of Pearl Jam's fan club and joins us from his office in Seattle. Tim, welcome to the future of what? Thanks, Portia. Good to be here. So, okay, Tim, give us the lowdown. How did you get started in the music business and how did you end up doing this very interesting job? I've been in bands and stuff my whole life. I started playing guitar, listening to Zeppelin, Hendrix, Beatles, Stones kind of thing. Back in St. Louis, always in a band since I can really, since I could pick up a guitar, basically. Um, I moved to Montana for college, continued playing in bands, started working in a record store, worked in a record store there for a long time, was part owner of an institutional record store called Rock and Rudy's, but still there today. And then um, at one point in 97, uh, I decided to get out of Montana. I moved to San Francisco and helped open the Amoeba store on Haight Street, the first big Amoeba superstore. I uh, was a buyer there, and it was kind of the apex of uh, record store jobs. Meanwhile, I was kind of fledgling there, not really enjoying life in San Francisco too much. I didn't have any money and was kind of alone. 
I hooked up with my old buddy Jeff Amick from Pearl Jam at one point. We went to a basketball game in L.A. together, and he told me that they had this incredible fan club, but it was not really making money. In fact, it was losing money, and they couldn't figure out why. And he thought it might be a good idea to bring in someone who had music retail experience, and I just happened to be one of those kind of people. So anyway, because we were friends that I'd known all the Pearl Jam camp for a long time, um, it kind of worked out that it was a perfect job for me. And so a couple of weeks later, I was interviewing, and a month after that, I was I was up here in Seattle. And that was 98, and I've been doing it ever since. So. Wow. So manager of a fan club might sound to some people like stalker in chief. <laughs> of course it does. <laughs> so do, do people look at you funny when you tell them that that's your job? Some, some people do. People that understand the way the music business kind of works these days, they get it, you know. Of course. They, under, they understand the value in having someone in my my position to be able to reach out and do this direct to consumer thing and a band that's that values that as much as anyone is is Pearl Jam. That's that's one of their their reputations. So yeah, I think that people who get it get it and the people who might be on the periphery kind of look at it as this funny thing that a guy would do that was really into a band. And I am a fan of the band, but I'm also <laughs> I'm also more of a, a business person than uh, your typical fan. So Right. Do you tell us about the job though because it's pretty interesting coming from a retail background. You know, what did you do to turn around the fan club, make it stop losing money and grow it? To be honest, I, you know, I, it wasn't like I came in and reinvented the wheel or or brought this like genius kind of vibe to the table. I It was sort of a, a bit of good timing on my part. In 98, there weren't really any models where bands or artists or even labels had kind of taken the internet <clears throat> in and made it sort of a vehicle for communication with the fans and definitely not a vehicle for commerce with the fans. So I just looked at it with the leadership of Pearl Jam that was in place. Kelly, Cur- Kelly Curtis, their manager in particular, has always been sort of a someone who gets the big picture was the edict to me was like, hey, let's take this thing online and figure out how we can make business doing it the internet way. And the record label had you know, built a site that was kind of chugging along and I was able to go in with them and create a new site that, in, that involved more of a store and a, a direct fan club membership kind of basis. So good timing. Good timing, and a yeah. business too. And that is interesting because, you know, the the traditional fan club that I can think of when I was when I was a kid, you know, I, I was part of the Rough Trade record club. So oh, you yeah, send off right. your whatever dollar or something and you get a seven inch every month. Bringing it online obviously created a lot of new opportunities. So what are some new opportunities that you have helped the band create in this online space? Well, I guess uh, kind of the first thing that happened when I when I got here is the band was in the middle of making this book with Charles Peterson and Lance Mercer that was basically just a, a photo book documenting the band's first um, six years or so. And we self-published the book and sold it. You know, I'm not really exactly sure if we were selling that book online or not, but one of the things we did is we got this massive mailing list together of our fan club database and sent them all an order form for this book. And and we realized right away that a good chunk of these people (laughs) wanted to buy this book because immediately we had response back just waves and waves and waves of of orders for this book. And so we thought, okay, so these people are engaged. We know how many there are. We know how many people are willing to, you know, turn this around and buy this thing. So that kind of gave us the idea that this this could be, you know, if we can figure out a way to digitally touch these people and get them engaged, whatever we do, as long as it's mindful and, and reflective of the band, could be really successful financially. So after the band played, uh, I think it was around 140 shows in 2000, Kelly Curtis, again, being the kind of genius that he is, <laughs> he thought it would be a cool idea. We've been talking about this for a while, too actually bootleg the bootleggers is what he called it but we, we were selling a lot or we weren't but record stores were selling a lot of bootleg cds of audience tapes and on you know like low quality bad artwork but people mm-hmm. were buying them right and left and we could see this from the band's forums 
So our, I, his idea was to, let's see if we can put these out in a more professional, higher quality manner. So we went to the record company. They thought we were crazy. We went back and forth over this concept. But at the, end of, at the end of the day, we did it. We did probably didn't do it exactly right, but we did it anyway. And we released all these records at the same time, all these bootleg CDs at the same time. And we broke a Guinness World Record with a number of titles in the top 200. And some of the international territories, rec, uh, live recordings were, were number one on the charts in, say, Portugal or Australia, Japan, stuff like that. So we had this kind of weird success with these bootlegs and so that was this that was the first phase of the the bootleg series and it, it manifested itself into like this crazy thing that we're doing now which is i'm um, selling them ourselves fulfilling them ourselves and their, their cds are made to order or we do digital downloads and it's a it's a really cool program for us over these long years that's really unique. And also, I think it's interesting that you guys basically, you you use the internet, you use the forums that you have online to see what the fans were doing, and then actually said, wait a second, we could do this better and probably add value for the fans, you know, by doing it ourselves. For sure. Make it a better quality product right. than just a handheld microphone. Yeah. And I think, I think what I've found certainly for my own, you know, with my own record label is that what fans really want is they want something that feels personal. So how do you guys deal with that with your band? Is there anything else you guys do? I mean, do they get online ever and do chats with their fans or anything like that? That's an interesting subject with them. I think that there was a decision made, and I'm, I can't, it's hard for me to speak on their behalf, and I can't put words in their mouth, but I think there was a time where, they wanted to talk to every fan. They wanted to interface with each person one-to-one. And I think that they tried to do that in different ways. And I, I feel like it became so over- overwhelming that they came to a point where they realized that the only way to really do that is at the show, right? So mm-hmm. everything outside of the, the concert environment is theirs. And everything during the concert environment belongs to the fan. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons why the set list is so important, I believe, is because that's the you know that's their time that's for them mm-hmm. so so as you know as opposed to like doing online chats or meet and greets the band says okay once we hit the stage we, we're going to give you everything we have outside of that we don't have the bandwidth to you know facilitate those kind of personal things so it, right. seems, it seems like a fair trade off to me yeah no that's true and i think most artists do discover that i think that's what happens you know if you only have 200 fans you can probably talk to each of them but once you get bigger it becomes really difficult tim thank you so much for joining us on the future of what thanks portia it's great to be here end today's show on direct-to-fan sales by talking with Benji Rogers. He's the founder and head of Pledge Music, a direct-to-fan platform, and he joins me in our New York studio. Benji, welcome to the future of what? Thank you very much. So give us the Pledge Music elevator pitch. The elevator pitch. Uh, Pledge is a place in which an artist can offer their fans the making of an album. So basically, when a band is in the studio, my opinion is that they are sometimes more interesting than when they are releasing an album. So by allowing fans to see into that process, they open up a whole new revenue stream as artists, and fans get to go along for the ride. So how are you guys different specifically from Kickstarter or some of those other platforms? So crowdfunding operates upon a principle of give me money now, then I will go make something. And it's always a very public financial target. We need 30 grand, then we will go make. Pledge operates differently in that we're literally pre-selling the record while it's being made from studio to stage. If you don't make your goal in a crowdfunding platform, it's failed within that 30-day time period or 60 days. Our campaigns will sometimes last a year. 
and they're not necessarily about, about funding. So someone like Frank Turner, who wants to offer his book, is going to say, once we hit a thousand sales, then it goes into production. Or someone like Lindsay Sterling is just going to pre-sell her record while it's in the process of coming into being with a special version for these pledgers only. Others will use it to fund things like, you know, manufacturing, production, press, etc. But it's not really designed for that. It's really designed via the system of updates to offer fans a view behind the scenes that is basically locked into their pre-order. And, you know, we've grown to now a super van base of close to a million people, all of whom just want to see albums while they're being made. And I think it comes down from my philosophy that people don't need more ways to buy or consume music. They need reasons. And when an artist is making an album, they're a lot more interesting than when they're selling an album. And so that that process is kind of muddied a little bit when you say, I need money, then I will go make it. And then for six months or a year, they're basically sharing on Facebook, Twitter to their backers this process, but with no way to kind of get involved. So we just tied it into a whole kind of bundle to where a label, an artist, can basically run these campaigns for all of their releases. You know, whether it's uh, uh, Rufus Wainwright making an opera or, you know, Duquette Johnston making his first album on vinyl, it's kind of a, it's kind of a good mixing ground and it's, a, it's become a super fan community. I met you several years ago at South by Southwest and the thing that I really remember from that meeting was that you taught me that every time an artist approaches their fans, they should give them an opportunity to get involved. Yep. And I think that that was like a huge insight yeah. for this direct-to-fan movement. I mean, I think it is. A lot of labels and artists and managers wanted to do direct-to-consumer because direct-to-fan is slightly harder, right? And direct-to-consumer was, we're going to put up items on a website for people to buy, which is a strange philosophy in the internet age where you've got you know massive platforms like Amazon, iTunes, etc. And direct-to-fan was really the way for an artist to say, be involved in what I'm doing. And the artist is still in complete control of it. You don't have to give away everything. But by offering that thread, you offer the the, the fan an ability to get involved in a way that they couldn't do normally. So one of our main campaign team wrote this open letter to Beyonce. She basically builds these campaigns for all of these amazing artists. She, she pre-orders, you know, uh, signed vinyl or test pressing or a lyric sheet, whatever it is. She spends like 60 to $100 per transaction with these more independent, less known artists. And when it came to Beyonce, who is her idol, quote unquote, she said, I bleed Beyonce, the most she could spend was $13.99 at iTunes. There was literally nothing else for her to do. And she was like, my favorite artist in the world is not letting me get involved, whereas these other artists that I love and want to support are. And so what I I look at, you know, 61%, according to Mark Mulligan, of music fans uh, are aficionado. They're super fans. They are responsible for 61% of all music buying and spending, and they can't do anything anymore. They're literally sent to a website to buy a product or a website to stream something. And what they're forgetting is, is if I can only spend twelve ninety nine, that's I'm stuck. I have a Google alert which says so and so band is in the studio, right? And every time I see this, I go, okay, Church is in the, is in the studio. What can I do? What is it? What what can what is possible for me to do at that moment as a fan? I can watch on Facebook, but then Facebook controls what I see. Mm-hmm. I could follow on Twitter but I got to catch it when it happens at that moment. So how do I, as a fan of that band, lock in? And I think that that's really the one of the major drivers of the financial engine of the music business of the future is if the super fans are sent to where they can only spend less or zero, which is YouTube and Spotify and you know the various streaming services, then that's not their fault. It really isn't. And I have this thought in my head that whenever a label lays out their release schedule for the next year, If there aren't pre-sales on deck for every single one of those releases from literally next month right the way through till Q1, someone should be fired. It should basically be like, the band's in the studio, why isn't it on sale? I don't understand because they're doing the fun part now. And as far as the engagement piece goes, the making of an album only happens once. The outcome is uncertain. And the process is fascinating to those who don't follow their dreams, who don't make albums. You know, I'm obsessed with Michelle and Degiacello. I technically know how to play bass. I couldn't ever do it like her. I technically know how to write songs. And I'm in awe of what she's able to do. But I'm not able to participate on any other level than streaming her album when it comes out or maybe buying some vinyl off of a website. Whereas if I could go further, I would, you know. And it's not 
certain artists aren't comfortable with it, but then certain artists will then be comfortable playing under Doritos stage or whatever it is. So like, what's the worst thing? Mm -hmm. Involving super fans or not? Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of those things whereby, you know, we've been going for five, six years now and fans want this and there's no downside to it. There is no downside by giving an artist this tool to be able to engage with their fans because it's still going to go to iTunes, still Amazon, still go onto the website for sale. All that will still happen. It's just a question of early on getting the fans involved. And that's why I said to every artist, what have you given your fans to do today? And liking something on Facebook when you're going to get zero reach now? I mean, that's what, what, what artist pages get, almost zero reach. You know, retweeting something is, a, is, is an action but I think it's got to be bound into a reason to get involved with that artist. So if an artist says, I'm going in the studio next week, your pre-order unlocks access to a cool part of that. And then when it comes out, you get to you know have been there and seen it as it happens is a win. And I think the hard part to position it is, is that you know a lot of times the philosophy is, well, I make albums and then I release them. I think that that's got to change because the industry has halved in size in the last 10 years, right? So it's obviously not working. Right. We have to look for alter alternative ways. And artists really do control that. Right. You know? yeah. yeah. Now, I think Pledge in particular as a platform really seems to work best for artists who already have somewhat of a fan base because you have to sell it to somebody who's already there. You can't kind of necessarily take a young band that has no fans at all. Mm. I mean... Uh, so... Yes and no. Yes, in that if that artist wants to do $100,000 in pre-sales, they're going to need people to show up and buy them. And we have uh, an algorithm which suggests artists to fans, like because we've got this big matching thing. We used to do it manually. We used to have humans curate, and we found that our algorithm was 70% more accurate than our, than wow. our human one, which is really depressing <laughs> um, and yet exciting at the same time. <laughs> So what we now do is, is we'll try and match the artist with the fan. But what I found is that it's actually easier for a small artist to reach more of their fan base than it is for a larger artist to reach more of their fan base in certain instances. Because if you've got 100 fans at your show, like your record release show, you can reach them. If you've got 10,000, it becomes harder just by the sheer weight of numbers. So 100 fans spending 100 bucks each versus 100 fans spending $13.99 each, one is clearly better than the other. And also, if you send those early adopter fans to iTunes or to Spotify, etc., you lose them to those platforms. On Pledge, one of the founding bedrock philosophies was is that the artist keeps all their data. So the, the bigger we get, the more artists and labels within that ecosystem own the information outwards. So when a band is starting, if they're going to email... 200 people that they know and they can get 50 of them to pre-order a record at 100 bucks each that's much better than sending those 50 people to itunes and saying pre-order it and then i believe it's the label's jobs to basically come in once there's that that initial groundswell selling 100 things to super fans like selling 100 albums that do not exist is quite a challenge right um, it's hard to do it when they exist at certain points and so what i believe is it's a proving ground in one sense so in your experience, what's the difference between a super fan and a casual fan? Super fans are men and women who want to get involved at a deeper level. They're not satisfied with just a lean back experience of listen to album when it comes out. They want the liner notes. They want the lyric sheets. They want the house concerts. They want to go above and beyond. And they spend, you know, on pledge alone, $61 per transaction on average. It goes much higher for smaller bands, lower for larger bands at scale. Uh, according to Nielsen, we, we did a study in 2013, which we unveiled at South By, which was basically we found that 34% of music fans identified themselves as aficionados. And they were responsible for around 70% or 75%, I think it was, of all music spending. So obviously to send them to a place where they can't spend would be crazy. Mark Mulligan's done some research where he talked about, um, I think, 61% are uh, of spending is by super fans so it's somewhere in the 61 to 70 percent either way it's significant and my point is that a small band reaching a hundred super fans at you know 60 to 100 dollars each is more powerful in certain senses than that same small band trying to reach the casual fans who though there are more of them 
spend a lot less. So I'm interested to know your perspective on the future of this direct-to-fan music. Where do you yep. see this going? I mean, do you see it just sort of becoming the overarching way in which bands interact with their fans? I think it'll become normal. At the moment, what we suffer from is a scenario in which the... No, we don't suffer from it, but we just battle against it, is just that labels do things in a certain way. They go, we need six months setup time, we need this, we need this, we need this, and then we can go into action. And what we've come along and done is to say, no, you just need to know that it will exist at a certain time, and then we can push it out there. And then it's talking to fans. A lot of times it's managers that need to understand it. A manager needs to understand that, like, your job is to get your band to do this. Otherwise, what is your job? I mean, you know, and I think that the future is that the if it's 61 or 75 percent of these aficionados are not able to spend, it's not their fault. And I think that the larger the pledge grows and we have a big vision to become a massive, massive direct to fan, super fan community owned by the artists and labels that put their music into it. I mean, that's the key. The data that we get is owned by those who put it in. Then it becomes a massive, sustainable profit point for any label or artist that uses it. For those that don't and try to basically push all their revenue through YouTube, Spotify and live, it's just going to be a challenge, right? And I think that, you know, for, I mean, you've got a label that has super fans that love your label. Artists have super fans as well. The goals of the streaming companies are not aligned with the artist's goals. The, the streaming companies need subscribers, but artists need subscribers too. They need fans. They need that connection. So the more that, that the artist pushes their super fans over to those platforms in the first instance, the more that they lose them on the on the second because you can't go back. Well, yeah, but I'll get it when it's on, you know, streaming service A, B, or C. And that's not bad, but the future is is the more artists that get that connection with their fans, the the larger that super fan ecosystem grows and can flourish. And then the dissemination game can get even bigger as well. So a super fan is going to ideally pre-order the record on pledge interact with the band throughout, share it when it comes out commercially, and still listen to it on the streaming services as well. Mm -hmm. If you miss that beginning step and just send them to the streaming services, how can it possibly make more money? Mm -hmm. How can it possibly right. be better for the artist? You right. know, it's literally just you're adding a step in, mm -hmm. which, you know, and it's funny. I'm sure your, your product team are like, okay, we've got to get the artwork in place. We don't need that. You got to get the album title. Don't need that. Reveal all that while it's happening, but don't reveal it in a press release that's saying so and so is going to come out. And you know, it's got to be locked into a, an integrated system. And it's a big ask. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a big ask to, to have labels change that. But I think it will be managers insisting on it and insisting that and saying to their bands, the album you're about to make is being promoted now. And the process of it coming into being in all of its messy, you know, ragged, strange, weird glory, that's the, that's that's part of what you sell to those super fans. And then we sell the rest to everybody else. And it doesn't preclude the other. It's as well as mm -hmm. that's the win. And, yeah. that, and that's how, and then that plus some fixing the pipes underneath and as how artists get paid, then we get to a hundred billion dollar business. Yeah. That's, That's awesome. Yeah. That's That would be fantastic. Yeah. Benji Rogers, thanks for joining us on The Future of What? Thanks for having me. Benji Rogers is the founder and president of Pledge Music, a direct-to-fan platform connecting artists and fans. He joined us from our New York studio. That's this episode of The Future of What? Will Watts and John Sepulvato produced the show. Our engineer is Stephen Cray. You can find all our episodes at killrockstars.com backslash the future of what? Special thanks to Argo Studios in New York. I'm... Portia Sabin, join us again for the future of what from X-Ray FM and Kill Rock Stars. <laughs>